then what I found out was when I started shifting out what I like to call out of my survivor brain and into my thriving brain, once I got into that thriving brain, I found out I was a pretty smart guy. I was an honor roll student, got a scholarship and everything. And the only thing that I really switched was how I thought about my body and getting rid of stress. Uh, stress was a killer for me. And I didn't realize how being angry, upset, and how that was causing me to, I mean, I thought I was being angry at other people, but it was really causing me to have the problems. And once I figured that out, basically it's been my life's journey to share that with other people that, and now I know that, hey, we can use our electrical system to do this, or we can use our biological system. Of course, you got to use them both, but so many people have misused their, like the, if you want to call it the sympathetic parasympathetic drive, that they're their biology is really taking a toll. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of your Adrenal Fix podcast, where our goal is to tell the truth about adrenal fatigue to exhausted and burnt out adults so that they can get their energy back quickly. And I'm really excited to interview for a second time, uh, Dr. Patrick Porter. We interviewed him back in July of 2018, and we had such a great interview, and I want to get caught up with what's going on in the world of BrainTap. But Dr. Patrick Porter, PhD, is the founder and chief BrainTap officer at BrainTap, which was created with a singular mission in mind, which is basically to better a billion brains. He's a head mind-based studies at Quantum, Quantum University and is a licensed trainer of NLP and is the author of six books, books including popu the popular Thrive in Overdrive, How to Navigate Your Overloaded Lifestyle. So Dr. Patrick, thank you so much for being here once again. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So I always like to start off with your own health journey. You did talk about that last time, but why don't you familiarize the, the listeners with why you got into wanting to help a billion brains and give us a little bit of the background in your history? Yeah, well, I like to tell people I was blessed to be the son of an alcoholic. And because of that, he went and got help. And what the, the main benefit was that he went and found out about meditation and, and specifically technology driven meditation. So we use music and we use machines called GSR machines and they, we didn't have neurofeedback back then. This is in the, in the mid mid seventies. So we had to use this machine that would measure our skin temperature, heart rate, different things like that. And so we started using those as kids. I mean, I remember my first uh, session that I ever recorded was I was 12 years old but I was held back in second grade. So I wasn't considered a you know very bright kid. I was a very artistic kid. Uh, but then what I found out was when I started shifting out what I like to call out of my survivor brain and into my thriving brain, once I got into that thriving brain, I found out I was a pretty smart guy. I was an honor roll student, got a scholarship and everything. And the only thing that I really switched was how I thought about my body and getting rid of stress. Uh, stress was a killer for me. And I didn't realize how being angry, upset, and how that was causing me to, I mean, I thought I was being angry at other people, but it was really causing me to have the problems. And once I figured that out, basically, it's been my life's journey to share that with other people that, and now I know that, hey, we can use our electrical system to do this, or we can use our biological system. Of course, you got to use them both. But so many people have misused their, like the, if you want to call it the sympathetic, parasympathetic drive, that their, their biology is really taking a toll. And actually that's kind of been your life mission now. So that's, a, that's what you're talking about. So that's how we come together, I think, in, in doing that. And I, I think when, once people reduce their stress load and we're not gonna get rid of stress, it's, it's how our body carries that stress that's most important. And do we have good strategies, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to get rid of the, that load, then we can manage it. Because I mean, think of a fighter pilot. I mean, they're, they're under stress, but they thrive on that stress. So whatever your life experience is, there are techniques or tools that we can help you with. Um, not myself, all of them, but you know, part of them, we can be a solution. We're really big on the thought trauma toxin model and you know, we've got to clear all those out. So we kind of fall into the helping with the trauma and the thought part of it. Yeah, and that's an awesome way to, to, to look at it. Uh, and also I would say, the, the spin you took on it is, 
is an example of why you've been able to successfully um, overcome that, that childhood because a lot of people wouldn't say they were blessed with that. They were cursed with that. So <laughs> as, as a young child, that was pretty enlightening. What, you said that you, you realized that there's ways to think or control your brain. Can you give us a little elaboration on that at that young age and what you know now? Well, at that young age, what we learned about was uh, the, the GSR machines, you'd actually put your hand on a cradle and it was pulse analysis, really. So it was, it was measuring your pulse rate. And there was an algorithm that would tell you if you were in a brain state called alpha. And so you'd set it for alpha or theta. You'd set it for a number, like let's say 10 cycles per second. And it would make a noise. Beep, 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 beep. And we used it, uh, my dad used it really for sports. He tricked us, you know, he, and, and he had me think of running track or playing football or whatever it was. And when I was in the middle of doing something, it would spike. It would go beep, 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 beep. But then as soon as you could calm down your mind around it, and focus on it, that sound, and then you get it to a point where it didn't make any noise. And I still remember the day that it really hit me like a brick over the head was I was doing really good. I was in a room practicing, no noise. I'm doing my deep meditation. My dad walked in and, and I, as he got closer, he was going beep, 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 you know, cause here's somebody I had to perform for, right? I was only 12 years old. So that I started using that. I started seeing those triggers so what are the triggers? What causes you to stress out? As soon as you know those triggers, I like to tell people you can take the remote control away if you know what those triggers are, because most of us have given, whether we watch the news or we watch, uh, we get a bad phone call, we get a text message, it's used to hijacking our biology and causing us into, to fall into this fight or flight kind of system that happens and a cascade of negative events start from there. So that was one way, also breathing, um, I took, I started getting into yogic breathing, uh, which now I do a lot of Wim Hof breathing, things like that, because I think it's really good. But breathing really does affect, uh, we've seen it in our measurements at our lab. You know, we have four different kinds of devices to measure brain waves, but we also have several devices to measure heart rate variability. And breath work is probably one of the fastest ways. I mean, you can do in a matter of minutes or seconds for some people, they can shift their physiology out of the stress state by, because all negative states, if people are really honest with themselves and think back, all negative states of consciousness, they're not breathing. Anger, fear, for, try to breathe through your, your next anger fit or your next fear fit. You, once you start breathing, it goes away because those negative emotions are stuck states and our physiology tries to hold on to them. But with a simple couple breaths, and, the, and of course the right breaths, you, your physiology can't hold on to that uh, chemical reaction that's happening in the body. Yeah, amazing stuff. And so you mentioned that you became aware of it and many people are not aware of it. You had to actually have that feedback of the beeping of the machine. Yet um, when we get stressed, you would think that someone would be aware of that. So you mentioned last time in terms of the addictive process and how we become addictive to these stressors or that sympathetic stress response. Can you give us a little insight in, in terms of how someone might be addicted that doesn't even realize that? Right, well, we've all been in an argument with somebody and we can see the person is angry, their face is red, their veins are popping out. And you say, why are you saying, I'm not angry? You know, they, so they don't even realize when they're in it. But the, the reality is that our brain is a 100 billion neural bit processor. So think about it. Eat one neuron, they say, is more powerful than the Cray computer, which is the most powerful computer on earth. And we have 100 billion of them. So we have this very sophisticated computer. It's always predicting our future. When somebody says they're not prejudiced, it's impossible to not be prejudiced because that's what our brain does every day. It's, it's how do we train our brain to predict. So our brain is always predicting things. So, and it gets used to certain things, even if we don't like them. It says, this is the way we are. Like some people call it a temperament, right? They go, Oh, Joel has this temperament or Patrick has this temperament. You know, the reality is that we've been trained into that. So that training becomes addictive in nature. When we, when we get away from it, one of the easiest ways I can tell people how they get addicted to this in physiology is just put your hands together if you're in a place where you can do that and see which thumb's on top and just roll the other thumb on top and notice what that feels like. You're probably going to notice that feels a little weird and that's only your thumb. So imagine your whole physiology when you're used to certain things. And that's why people have the sayings about buttons that pushes my button that that makes me angry when all I have to do is hear their voice and it triggers it 
and this has to do with something that is that uh, Skinner created actually, and Pavlov kind of talked about too, when we talked about the ringing bell and the salivating dogs. What most people don't know about that study is that it went on after the study was ended, they started to notice the dog started salivating when the guard would walk to ring the bell. Then the guard, when they stopped feeding the dogs at that time at all, they still were salivating. Now, even though we're not dogs, obviously we're humans, uh, we, have a, we have a biological nature. 95% of what drives us is subconscious. It's through our biology. 5% is our conscious every day. I mean, we've got too much going on by, in our biology to, to be worried about the 50,000 cells that need to change, how to digest the food we have for breakfast, you know, all the different things, how to convert oxygen into energy in the body, how to, how to convert light through our chrom chromoforms and, and create ATP at the cellular level. You know, all these things are happening, literally trillions of things that are all being handled by our subconscious. And so we're only conscious of it when we become aware of it. Like if I said, become aware of your right foot. Oh, now I'm aware of my right foot. Before that, you probably weren't because it wasn't important. So we become addicted because the brain, another thing I like to, to another way that people can identify with this is if you've ever walked up to a door and opened it without really thinking about it, then you should be able to answer this question. Which way does a doorknob turn? Does it turn right or left? And most people, they can't think, they have to think about it but we don't think about it when we're doing it. It's unconscious, right? We just get up and do it. Doors open both ways, right and left. They always turn toward the hinges and somehow our subconscious knows that before we get there. So just like every other emotion, I mean, just think about, we have positive emotions too. If we, we see a family member or friend we haven't seen for a while, that's why actually during the shutdown is so bad. I mean, we're not, I mean, we get to see people through Zoom, but we don't get the uh, bio photon effect, you know, where we're sharing energy, you know, in the room, you know, that, that happens. So we, we have this, uh, we don't have the same interaction, you know, but when we see somebody that we really love and appreciate, we haven't seen them for a while, the emotion just comes, we can't stop it. I mean, some people will actually tear up and cry because they, you know, so much emotion shows up. Our body is basically conditioned to do that. You know, and unfortunately, too, you know, I was brought up Catholics and that, that's not unfortunate. That was OK. But the what they the Benedictine monks said, if you give me a child to their seven, I'll give you a Catholic for life. And the reason they that's a quote that's out there on the Internet. The reason is that's any religion. Right. Any. And I'm not I think everybody has to have a practice. So that's not a bad thing. But I mean, they know that, hey, that's you get conditioned at a young age. And then at about seven or maybe even earlier for some people probably between six and nine years old, you stop taking in so much information. We still take it in, but we have much better filters. And Joe, most people don't know that there's a filter even on what we hear. We're, our ears bring in 25,000 pieces of information every second, but we typically only act on 40 of them or less because they're not meaningful. But we, that doesn't mean we're not processing those other 25,000. We're just not aware of them. Our eyes bring in 20,000 pieces, I mean, 2,000 pieces of information. Again, we only act on about 50 to 40 of them. So we're, our brain is a great filtering system. And unfortunately, we trained it. And then we trained it to get angry. We trained it to get upset. We trained it to get stressed. Some people are so addicted to stress that they have a great night's sleep. But before they even get out of bed, they start catastrophizing. You know, that's visualizing experiencing going over in their head and before they get out of bed they're all lathered up and they're all angry and upset and they don't even know why it's because it's it's almost like a computer program that's been booted up in the system yeah it's amazing for people to to have that aha moment so if we could help them have that aha moment you mentioned for yourself you had the ability to hear that sound and be aware of it um, what would be, and obviously you talked about breathing, getting breathing going, um, but as we circle into the brain tap and what it does before we get there, um, how does someone become aware that they're addicted to, to the stress? Well, I think the main thing is just like all high performers, all you, you think of Olympic athletes or sports people or just high performance in general, they're always reviewing what they did. So many people just, they do it and they go, well, that's just, that's just me. I'm sorry. I can't, but you can go back and you can, maybe you don't have a film room and you have a series of, I mean, I, I do recommend you get coaches, but let's say that you have somebody who's looking over, helping you to uh, make you accountable, but you can first be accountable to yourself, be honest with yourself. And 
one of the things I learned really early in my therapy career was about uh, golfers. And what they would do with golfers is they hit a bad shot. They would not leave that spot. Professional golfers do not leave that spot till they visualize it three or more times perfectly because they know the subconscious doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So when they leave that spot, they're not carrying that negativity with them. You know, so many people carry that negativity. And this is, I'm using golf as an example, but it could be from one communication to the next, one encounter to the next. Uh, you know, the best golfers are able to isolate that. Just like the best footballers, you know, when, if you're a quarterback and you throw three interceptions in the first half, like Tom Brady did, then come back and throw four touchdowns and win the Super Bowl. I mean, that's somebody who can compartmentalize and they, they assess and they don't, they don't think the past performance is an indicator of future performance. You know, a lot of people just say, well, that's the way it is. We can interrupt that pattern just by becoming aware of it. In fact, there's something called the observer effect in quantum physics and anything that we observe, we change. So just by becoming aware of it, that's why I'm not a big believer in talk therapy, although my degree is in psychology, because a lot of times it just exacerbates the problem. They just get a better rehearsal. But if you can, that's why when you bring it up, now you got to do something with it. Don't just talk about it. How would you do it differently? What would you say differently? How would you experience it differently? Then how could you forgive that person? How could you become more grateful about the encounter? You know, there's, if we can put little definitions around it where we say, hey, life is a learning experience. How can we learn from what we've experienced and make our lives better? And I really like to tell people about, I mean, Buddha said it 5,000 years ago when he said, he who angers you conquers you. And now medical science is proving that because if we feel angry and upset about anyone, we know that it affects our physiology, right? It affects the way that our body responds. We start creating those same uh, endolupins and brain chemicals that flow through the body that destroy our body. But if we, if we, we don't have to, we can pray for them, love them, whatever. If we do that, and that's why it says pray for our enemies, it's going to help you as an individual, you know, and maybe it'll do something to them, who knows. But the reality is you need to do it for yourself. And so I think the habit is to just start interrupting that pattern, rehearsing, you know, there's not a, there's not a television actor or actress that gets on to a movie set or a TV show that doesn't rehearse. But how many people get up every morning doing the same thing, complain about it all day long, complain about it at night, and then go to sleep, never rehearsing what they're going to do the next day. The biggest thing is to start rehearsing what you would prefer in life, not what you intend in life. So there's, there's, a, big, there's a big difference there. Yeah, but that's awesome information, Patrick, because I find <clears throat> part of me that, you know, and you're getting into the world or have already been in the world of biohacking and, and people want to take certain nutrients or be on a specific diet or understand their genetic component or even take functional medicine testing, which all of things that I do, but if they're not addressing the day-to-day moment-to-moment second-to-second thought processes and understanding their triggers and having outside eyes help them identify those triggers or the reactions or as you said the pushing of the buttons they're never going to change that Um, and ultimately like you said if we're processing so much information visually auditorily tactilely in all different ways, and we're already biased against those and somewhat addicted to reinforce the same patterns, it it becomes a a never-ending vicious cycle of feed forwarding, which gives us a good segue into, we talked about before we started, the social experiment where, or sorry, the social dilemma, where we have the engineering of the information that we're given to even much more um, filter it down and have it be more biased. And so maybe if for those that don't know or haven't seen it, but I'm sure that they have the social dilemma, how that, how that overlaps with how we become addicted to stress, and then we'll come up with solutions and, and, and how, to, how to combat that. Right. I think what, what, unfortunately, what they've done is there's an algorithm. It's not a person sitting there. Like a lot of people think there's a person sitting there doing that. There's no button. There's no person doing this. It's all being done by uh, artificial intelligence, which looks at an algorithm, which means when you like something, you approve something, you comment on something, all of that is giving a weight and a measure. And so what they do is their whole job on these social platforms is to get you on there longer so they can serve up a, something that you might buy. 
you know, and believe me, they're always listening. I mean, I've been with my, my son and we talked about garage door openers and uh, I don't need a garage door opener. He did. But then when I went back on to Amazon and other places, I started getting ads served up to me for garage door openers. And I didn't, I didn't type it in. I didn't write it in. There was no reason for me to even look for it. I was just in a conversation with him. So they're always, you should just know that they're always listening. Um, and it's not a person. There's not a person listening. So you don't have to worry about that. There's an intelligence in the, it's serving up these algorithms. Now, you might wonder, I don't care what, I'm, I'm not political as much as I'm American. So the, uh, I, want, I want what's best for America. So, but it, depending upon what political slant you have, you're gonna get served up more of that information. So you might be saying, wow, don't they know about this? No, they don't. Because every talking head is telling you what you've already clicked, said, liked, shared, commented on. So you're only getting fed one way. It used to be that we'd hear all the opinions, but it, everything is being skewed. Now, some of our mainstream media, even in, without going from the social media, now they're skewing things too. I mean, you have, you have to pick your source. You know, who do you want to listen to? Because they're, uh, I like a thing called the Epoch Times uh, in the Epic Times. They're not sponsored by big biz, big, big farmer or anybody. And you get really news. It's like an old newspaper, but they do it digitally too. But they give you both sides of the story. And they, but what happens with social media is if you're feeling angry and upset, unfortunately, they deliver you more angry and upset information. You know, if, if I, and I, I challenge anyone out there that thinks that they're getting a lot of negativity on their social media, stop liking, stop sharing, stop watching that. Go on to sites that are about gratitude, love, about health and healing. You're going to find your whole information stream on social media will change in about seven days you'll change the algorithm about yourself. Because if you don't like who you are, it's gonna show up in social media. And unfortunately, it, it's probably not what you want because you might be going there. Let's say you go on there and you look up uh, how to uh, suicidal thoughts, let's just say, which is not a good thing to type into social media because now every drug company in the world now knows that, and believe me, they own 50% or more of all the social media sites and unfortunately, the Department of Justice owns probably the other 50% or, or close to it. So we have we have all the, so now what they're doing is they're saying, okay, let's serve up this ad, this ad, this ad. And it's all about whatever you just typed in. So it's not safe anymore. Uh, it's not like, but again, it's not a person doing this. It's an algorithm and they're doing it. I've had people actually tell me, I think it's great. I don't even have to think of what I want. I just go on social media and it's, it's like, it's reading my mind. It is, it's reading your clicks, likes, approval, how much, it even knows when you spend time on a site, how much time you're spending watching a video. And it ranks all that, everything you do. And if you haven't watched the movie, I really encourage you to watch it early in the evening so you can have at least two or three hours before sleep to do something more positive because it, it'll leave you thinking, oh my God, Orson Welles was right. You know, what's going on? And they're doing it really to drive their bottom line. They're not doing it to ruin anybody's specific life. They're doing it to sell products, you know, to and to raise the value of their their media, you know. So it's it's a crazy world that we live in, and I think you know you can control that more than you think. You can control it because it's just an algorithm. Right. I mean, awareness again is key in in all of this, but it's it's almost like the same things that you talked about before we even brought this up is is being aware of your thoughts and, and being open to the, the half full thought versus the half empty thought mm -hmm. and not clicking on everything to really avoid that, um, which, which is now we can get into when that's not enough. So you, amazingly, I can see the genesis of being a kid, having the blessing of an alcoholic parent, um, learning uh, biofeedback and how stress impacts you. And as you mentioned in our last talk, technology advances. So, so let's talk about frequency and how we are frequency following response mechanism creatures and how we can harness that to, to create coherence and a healthy brain. Right. So first for the listeners, everything in creation is vibrating. It has a frequency or, or harmonics. When you, if you and I were in the same room, uh, Dr. Joel, we would be resonating. And that's why even in our Bible, it says when two or more gathered, there I am, because there's another frequency, there's another presence there. That's why healing in persons, when people do the hands on healing, or they go see their chiropractor, they get 
such different results. And it's kind of hard to do those things without it. So everything, our lights are a frequency. The sound we're hearing is a frequency. Everything is a frequency. So our nervous system, let's just use that for a moment. 30% of our nervous systems in our body, 70% is in our brain. So the 70% in our brain is actually interpreting the other 30%. It's bringing it in through our eyes, ears, smell, taste, touch, and everything. And our biggest sensory organ is actually our skin. You know, they've done experiments where they've watched people watching people. And the person knows, they don't know how they know, but they know when someone's watching them. And we've all had that experience. You know, we might be at a bookstore or something reading and look around, somebody's staring at you or something like that. You just know that's happening. And that's because there's a frequency there. But we can use these frequencies to change our biology. So in our environment, there's actually in, in Chinese medicine, they actually have something called feng shui, which is the flow of, there's a flow to everything. And it's really energy. Everything is energy. Everything in, I like to tell people we live in a quantum sea. So this, in this quantum sea, there's a gap between when it becomes real and not real, you know, and there's a, depending upon your beliefs in quantum physics and all that is that nothing is real to or there. Like the old story, if the tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? And the quantum physicists say, what tree, what forest? Because unless you're there, it doesn't exist. You know, so, but whatever, whatever your beliefs are, in our mind, we know this is true, that things are, things are as we believe they are by the way we perceive them and receive them. So our body is a receiver and a transmitter. In fact, uh, one of the things I've learned since uh, we talked two years ago was that communication in our body isn't just through our nervous system, through our fascia and through our dura that wraps around our brain, they consider this like a fiber optic cable and something called biophotons are emitting at, at the level of our DNA every 40 seconds. So that means we're not, when a metaphysical person says we're light beings, science has proven that's to be fact now. It's not, it's not a metaphysical concept. We are changing our epigenetics change every 40 seconds on all the trillions of brand, uh, strands of DNA. That junk DNA that we were told about, it's vibrating. It's teeming with life and it's emitting every 40 seconds. It's instructing through the dura and through the fascia. It's instruct, it's faster than our nervous system. It's the speed of light, you know? So of course, everything in the nervous system, some people would say also is light. So all this is happening. Now it's all interpreting our reality because also everything else is throwing off light. That's why we can see it. Something at the, at our, at the, very, at the very nature of our cells called chromoforms, it actually think of it like a, a photoreceptor that takes in heat, uh, the energy from the sun, stores it in our Tesla batteries and gives us energy. Well, our cells do the same thing with light. So whatever color we are, when somebody says, hey, you're white, green, yellow, pink, whatever, purple, that color is actually the color you're not. It's not the color you are. Your body is actually reflecting that color to the world. Every other color your body is absorbing you know, at that point. So in our, in our system, our body absorbs that as energy. So that's one way we do it. So let's say that we, we go to the ocean together and we're sitting by the ocean. Our nervous system is going to adapt. It's gonna harmonize or become coherent with the ocean. You know, now we could disrupt that by playing heavy metal music and all sorts of other things. Like Dr. Emoto's work, uh, I recommend people the, the, the Secret Life of Water it's awesome. They just did a, I was just on a presentation with uh, his research people because he passed away in, in India just last week. And they oh. showed a picture of what the water molecule looks like when you say COVID-19. It looks like a demonic water crystal. If you put the COVID-19 on a bottle and you put in gratitude, it becomes this beautiful looking thing because gratitude wins over. But if you put COVID in fear, it becomes even worse. So that's what we're, what, that's what's happening right now, COVID in fear. It's not, not COVID in gratitude, COVID in health. So when, so when we're by the ocean, we're resonating to a frequency, our personal body is, the ocean is resonating at about 10 Hertz frequency, just happens to be alpha. Our body then creates a coherence with that. It then tells the brain, hey, wow, this is alpha. Alpha then instructs our chemical system or our biology to produce acetylcholine and a host of other things that make us feel good. Now, if you're if you have adrenal fatigue, which is one of the things you're a specialist in, then you're probably going to fall asleep because you can't handle it. 
because the only reason you're alive is those stress hormones. I mean, the only reason you're functioning and your, your actual behaviors are helping you to, maybe you're drinking a lot of coffee, teas, stimulants, whatever it is, those stimulants are just propping you up. It's like, there used to be a, a story that they would never sell a horse until it's, it was in the stall for four days because they would always give the horses to go to markets caffeine because they look better. You know, they're, they're standing up straight. They're doing, but if you saw them after four days of no caffeine, what did they look like? You know, then you saw the real horse, you know, not the, so the same thing's true with people. But also, so that happens with the ocean, but it also happens on a physiological level. We walk outside, it's cold, we'll shiver to warm ourselves up. If it's hot, we'll sweat. If we go to the mountains, for instance, where most people think they need to go to meditate, like we see gurus meditating in the mountains, the reason for that is those mountains actually have a resident frequency as well. And our bodies, again, will create coherence with its environment all the time. And that's at 7.8 hertz frequency. That happens to be theta, where you'll now produce the electrical system tells the biological system, create GABA. GABA is what we need to sleep. And when people aren't sleeping well, it's not what happens right before sleep, although that's important, you know, making sure the lights are turned down and you have a good environment to sleep, good sleep hygiene. But it's also about what did you do the whole rest of the day? You know, it's, it's not like you can, just like these, the statement, you can't supplement a bad diet. You know, you, you, have to, <laughs> you, have to, you have to do there's kind of a balance there. You can supplement a good diet and get great health, but you can't supplement a bad diet and get good health. The same thing is true with your life in general. So the science that they call it, they call it frequency following response because they've noticed in nature, there's certain harmonics going on. You know, even at the, even redwoods, when they're in, in Northern California, they found out if one tree has enough water, it will actually give water to the next tree. Now, how does it know that? You know, so, and this happens in biological systems all the time. So our biological system, unfortunately, we're, we're bombarded with a lot of fears. These bodies haven't really changed in the last 100,000 years, right? And they're designed to maybe have this stress effect happen maybe five times in a week. Now they're saying the average person has these heavy duty, high level stress events encounters 10 times a day. So, and some people actually are encouraged, like they can't go to sleep without watching the news. That's probably the worst thing you can do. That's an addiction. Now, if you wanna watch the news, watch it earlier in the day, Watch some things that calm down your, your sympathetic system so that you can get the parasympathetic going and get into that rest and relax. Because most people think of it like just a light switch, you know, that you can just turn it off and on. And that can be true, but the reality is more like a gear shifter, you know, and we have all these different gears and a, a really flow, let's say a high performer who's worked on their body, their mind, their spirit, all of these things, their body works more like an automatic transmission where people who have a lot of stress, it works more like an, I mean, the, uh, they works more like a standard transmission, these people with stress, because they get stuck in like second gear, third gear. And even though they want to sleep, they can't get out of that high gear, they need to downshift, but they can't get out of that, that system. So it's all about flow and getting the brain to move through these different brainwave states, your environment can play a big role, like even listening to music, there's something called the Mozart effect, which is what happens when we listen to classical broke music, or some of this uh, new age kind of music that's out there without drums, our body will literally sink to that. And science shows that we're actually smarter when we listen to that music. We didn't learn anything new, but what we do know we have access to because it harmonizes the hemispheres of the brain. And we know through our research, if your brain is harmonized, which means the hemispheres are communicating across the corpus, the corpus callosum, that's what takes short-term memories, makes them long-term memories and back. If you're stressed out, there starts to become misfirings that happen there that causes stress, anxiety, depression, all the negative things that we hear about with, with brain function. Yeah, no, lots of rich information there. Uh, in terms of the easy way to think about it is just like you mentioned, everything has a frequency and vibration. And if you're stressed out, that vibration is, as you would think, very, very quick. And ultimately, we have that that may be good for a short term, but not long term. Um, but we also need the ability to go through the different frequencies for different healing mechanisms. So maybe talk about that with what you've invented, uh, Patrick, with the brain tap and how that has such deep, impactful physiological effects from deep sleeping to detoxifying to rejuvenating. Let's talk about that. 
Right. One of the most recent things that happened that we didn't even realize till we saw it on, somebody told us about it on social media was the WNBA started using brain tap during oh. the COVID lockdown. And the main reason was that they needed a way to get them to get rid of their stress and recharge. And most of the sports teams that we work with, whether it be the Sports Kansas City, which is the soccer league team, they put together a 20 station room with brain tap because most people know how to go, go, go but they don't know how to slow down, re reboot, recharge, rejuvenate, what I call the healing brain. They need to get into that healing system. So what BrainTap does using light, sound, and vibration, because that's those are three of the main things. You could use also something olfactory, like if you have a good essential oils, things like that can trigger, like frankincense is a good one. You can also use certain things like a certain taste, but we use the, the main three, the vibration, and we, we use those frequencies of light, sound, and vibration to slow down the brain. We start off at a, a frequency where we're awake, which is called beta. We, we call that the reactionary mind. So we match that. We train the brain first, and our brain loves patterns. So it, it attracts to the pattern. And even though the conscious mind doesn't know what the heck is going on, that part of us that's interpreting all that data says, hey, there's something here. I need to, for neuroplasticity to happen, which is what we need as we grow older, uh, keep our brain functioning. It has to be novel. It has to be something that can be repeated. The, so the brain is going, wow, what is this? What is this like? What is this sound? What is this like? What is this sound? What is this frequency? It's, it's basically evaluating it through something called the default mode network or what we call the reticular activating system. So these systems are alive and, and operating all the time. So once we have our algorithm, it slows down the body. All these things slow down together at a certain pace. And depending upon what region of the brain we're trying to relax or what the exercise is, every session is different because if you listen to the same one, even if you listen to the same one for seven straight days, it's going to have a diminishing return because once the brain learns the pattern, uh, this is a frightening fact that, that happens with mice. If one mice anywhere in the world Knows how to run a knows how to run a maze. They can't use that maze in any other lab in the world. Do you know that? That's a that's a crazy statistic. So what that means is somehow these mice have a group consciousness. The same thing's true with humans. It's like so the board on uh, Star Trek. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So think about what happened with with Banner in the four minute mile. You know right. now high schoolers run. A sub four minute mile, you know, so these beliefs are out there. So we have these belief systems right now. Unfortunately, our group consciousness is all in fear and stress and frustration. But I believe that just like lighting a room, it only takes one light bulb. Doesn't matter how dark the room is. You turn the light on, it's going to fill the room. So we just need to get these people some information so they can turn on their own power. We fear, anxiety, lack of breathing, lack of movement. These are things that destroy our biology. And unfortunately, there are things they're telling us we need to do, like quarantine, don't get out in the sun, <laughs> don't communicate with people. These are not healthy things. And even though um, the World Health Organization actually said that lockdowns aren't good, we should be doing them. It's right on their website now. They said they made a mistake. They also said that only 6% of the deaths that they actually said are real. It's right on their website. It's not something I'm making up. People can go there and read it. The mainstream news isn't sharing that. Because they know that, uh, you know, unfortunately for most individuals, negative information gets more activity than positive information. You know, one of my favorite studies in marketing was they, the, uh, an agency came out with a way to save 19% on your electric bill. So they sent out a mailer said, hey, you can save 19% on your electric bill. Well, har hardly any response. So a marketer came along and said, hey, let's change that message. You're, you're, you're wasting 19% of your money by not taking advantage of this one little tip. And they, they had over 57% of the people respond to that because it was negative. You know, so we need to shift our consciousness. We need to shift our capacity. And I think that has to do with like the rats in the maze, you know, the, or the mice in the maze is that unfortunately our news is primarily negative. We need to, we need to be celebrating our positive things that we do. That's why my first company was called Positive Changes. You know, we, we need to get people to become, you know, celebrate the things, the victories that you have. Sure, you're going to have some negative things, but there's never been a better time to be alive than today.
I mean, even though what we're experiencing is kind of bad, you know, it's really negative. Uh, but the reality is that, I mean, we all have a symphony in our pocket. Think about it. We can play any piece of music we want. Just turn on our phone and do it. Some people will choose music that heals their body. Some people will choose music that's destroying their body. So we have that choice with all technology. Yeah, awesome stuff. I think as more people uh, raise their frequency and energy levels, hope, hopefully I would imagine that the collective frequency will now be more favorable, um, but we have a long way to go on, on that. As far as the biohacking world and, and HRV and, and being able to test someone's pre before they would do the brain tap and test their post, um, can you take us through how they increase their HRV, which is a marker of increased parasympathetic rest and digest um, from the brain tap and what changes in the HRV you're seeing so that people have an idea what is it actually doing? Right. Well, one of the studies we just did was uh, we took 55, 65 year old women pre and post one session with brain tap and we showed a 23.7% improvement in neurological function. Now, how this does this, your heart has 40,000 neurocells called neutrino cells. This is a heart brain. So they now know that brain is what controls the show, not the one between your ears. This brain is almost like, uh, this is the brains and this is like a drone. <laughs> you know, it's telling the rest of the body what to do. So if you're there, you probably heard the expression, if your heart's not in it, you know, you're not gonna win it, you know, the, something like that. So this, this heart brain, is actually sending communications, twice as much communication to our brain and our head than down. Now, you also know about the HPA axis. So, you know, you're talking about the gut brain. There's more neuron connections in the gut than either of those. So you know, most of your neurotransmitters are made in the gut. So this triangle of activity is what they're really recording. So we can tell by your heart because every cell of your body is vibrating. Every organ is vibrating. You actually have an energy signature. Every person on earth does and every cell does so that we can send a low level current through your body. This is how all HRVs work anyway, but we send it through the body. And then from that resistance, because they know what it should be, our, our body, the more resistance in the body, the more stress in the body, the less restri restriction in the body. That means, are you hydrated? Hydration plays a big role in HRV. You know, if people aren't drinking half their body's weight in ounces of water, it'll show up. We'll see that. If they're eating too much sugar-based foods or foods that are toxic, it'll show up in their HRV. If they didn't sleep well at night, it'll show up in their HRV. These are some of the simplest things that happen. But what we can tell is because the HRV can change with a thought. You know, we've all had the experience, unfortunately, we're getting ready to go to bed, we get a text and it's not a good one. And then, oh, we gotta go to bed with this negative text and then you, so you go, well, I got to go to bed, but you lay in bed tossing and turning because of the text or the email or whatever, the news that we just heard. That's because it can, that's our heart rate that's changed, our coherency, they call it. Once we're coherent, now the people that are the healthiest are those that can take that traumatic event. Oh yeah, it's, it's traumatic and they act on it, but then they can, re, they can go back to their healing state. They can switch between that, the sympathetic and parasympathetic you know, in without all this, but when somebody gets stuck in it now, how did the listener know they're stuck in it? If you have something negative that happens in the morning, you're still talking about it in the evening, you're stuck. <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, I'm sure that family members have probably told them, get over it. That happened 30 years ago. If you're still talking about your parents or the blame for where you're at today, get over it. It's your HRV. It doesn't have, Freud was wrong. I'm going to tell you right now, because your parents have nothing to do. Your parents weren't trained. You know, there's something called the blame game. And if people are using the blame game, then the biology mirrors our thoughts. That's the, that's the biggest thing. So, but if, we're, if we have gratitude, I'm, I still remember in Hawaii one year, there was a guy that came over. This is before doing any of our technology either. He was just so happy. And I said, man, I want to get his, I want to get his HRV just to see. He maxed out everything. He didn't do any supplementation. He didn't do anything. He said, he said, he just got back from a retreat in India with his guru. And he was just like, he was just bubbling with energy and, and but he was smiling on people that smile. So what we know is that if you do something with the intent and purpose that it's gonna be healthy, it will show up because emotionally we make a difference, energy and motion. Uh, and we can measure it. We can measure when you take supplements. Now, some supplements take a little bit more time uh, because they have to metabolize, but there are certain supplements we've, we've done that help with heart 
coherency. Um, that there's a lot of different ones out there right now. Uh, we use one called blood effects that uh, they can use for exercise, but it helps with your heart and helps with blood flow and better than taking aspirin or something. If somebody's doing that, you know, it's a natural way of doing it. And then we've also found like PMF, which I know you're probably familiar with uh, this, this frequency. We love it, but it doesn't respond well to HRV at the moment. But if you do their HRV three hours afterwards, it's like exercise. So when you do, an, if you do a strenuous exercise, you're going to see your heart, your your heart rate variability is going to worsen because of exercise. But you're stressing the body. All growth happens through stress. So when somebody says, "I don't want any stress in my life," I don't want any, then they don't want any growth in their life. Now, how do you manage that stress? It's not the stress that's most important; it's the recovery. So one of the things that we love to to view on the HRV is how well does somebody recover. If you're not recovering well, then you're probably overtraining if you're a high performer. If you're recovering well, then your training is right. A lot of times we're working with Olympic athletes or pro athletes, they're overtraining and they need to take more time to recover, more time to, to work on themselves in that way than not doing enough. I mean, most high performers are overdoing it. You know, they're, they're pushing their body to the absolute limits. How do you measure recovery on that? Well, you can tell, you can do right afterwards, what is there? And then we do it like 30 minutes later and an hour later. And we can tell- After exercise? Yes, you mean? did they go back okay. to, after exercise? Did they go back to their okay. biological norm? They should improve. Like with exercise, let's say you get up and let's just say the number's 95 because you're an Olympic athlete. You work out, now it's down to a 73. Half hour later, it's at, it's at 95 again. Wow, that's great. And then an hour, a little bit after that, maybe it's 100. Now you know their, their biology is working really well because you should improve your, the, one of the best things you can do to improve your nervous system and as well as your brain is exercise. That's the only one that actually most people will agree on, you know, and right. that has to do with moving and breathing and, and keeping the body healthy. Awesome. So basically you're saying that your stress response or your ability to get out of that sympathetic response um, for highly trained athletes and even just the weekend warrior should get better. And if you're not getting within that, um, that baseline that you measured prior to the activity within what, an hour, Pat, yeah, Patrick, or hour. is that what it is? Closer to an hour. And if not, then they're overtraining. And then you could utilize the brain tap. Would that be one of the ways as well that you would give them some abilities to improve? Yes. You know, one of the things we did a little study with uh, Sporting Kansas City, which is the professional soccer team, is they started doing, because they already did recovery with the, the um, compression boots, you know, that you'd wear to push the blood out. So I said, hey, right. while they're doing that, let's see how they respond with just that or how they respond with the brain tap about a 30% improvement in recovery time when they use brain tap with it and they're using it for recovery. So the most professional athletes are doing something like that anyway. So just throw on the headset for 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes and, and just accelerate that because the stress, and we've talked about this in the last podcast was the stress is brain stress. You know, right. the, the brain is adapting And when you're performing, most athletes are performing high level physics. You know, like when they're catching a football or throwing a baseball or batting or playing soccer, those are, they're doing equations and moving their body at the same time. That's why when you see somebody who's uncoordinated and you ask them to, to count and, and walk at the same time, some people can't do it or do the alphabet and walk at the same time. It's amazing. That's one test. If you're listening, if you can't do that, you've got some, you've got some brain stress that needs to be worked on. And that's where exercise comes in. Like people like do cross crawl or do all the like Feldenkrais or that kind of work to get the brain going. There's a lot of, or Egoscue. There's a lot of different methods to retraining the neurology. Right. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So I recently went on a, a, a unattended sabbatical with the brain tap, um, but I got back into it. And so you have over 800, I would imagine over eight, more than 800 now. Or, we have over 1,300 sessions now on the brain tap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to use your knowledge for my benefit here. I ha can you suggest, I haven't been, I've been through a lot, but maybe some that's not on my radar that I can, I can tap into. Well, series. Do you, you want it for recovery, you mean? Or? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I've been through a lot of them, the, the addiction series, the, 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 the wealth series, the internet series, the, the, the health series, but I, I know there's so many, I'm missing something that I could get a lot of benefit from. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that we always recommend is just doing different ones. So if you're, if you're wanting to wake up, you know, and do those things, then there's the series called Better Life Me. That's a series right. about building a brainwave called SMR, which is more for distributor work. We, that's the one we would encode for sports and athletes, but it's more about okay. life in general. It helps life in general. That's one of the, the big ones. If somebody's wanting to um, just improve their biological function and that kind of thing, um, they don't really have any health issues or whatever. We have a, a life mastery series that people will use. Um, that one takes you from challenging your risk zone. Like I said, you only get growth if you risk. You know, I love that that meme that shows your success is outside and your comfort zone is over here, you know, and, but people, we need to get people out of their comfort zone to do that. And it's really about continuous use. And, you know, it's like brushing your teeth. You've got to do, you have to have some kind of mindfulness practice in order to maintain health into, into old age. The reason that I like Brain tap, of course, not just that I invented it because I used it before I had um, the total rights to it, but it's because we're adding light to the equation. Light is the most underprescribed nutrient on earth right now. Now, I know you use lasers and things like that. So you're using light in a lot of different ways, but there's also light panels. So we want to get light into the brain. So if you're not doing it, you need to get outside, do some breathing, grounding, you know, doing some things. So the, what we know with the brain tap is it's the number one line of defense for EMF poisoning, like Dan DeBon, who wrote the book, Radiation Nation, he even wrote in his book that the first line of defense is to get the brain tap because they've had such, uh, we use something called the Wabi. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a brain scan device. Um, it's really powerful device. And they, they put everything up in the cloud so they can correlate it with other doctors. And they, they found that when they, the doctors that were using brain tap with their brain recovery were getting such massive improvements quickly that we now we're working more closely with them on a couple other studies. But the reality is that just doing, there's not like, I wish there was a magic wand, but it's more like symptom specific. Like um, we just did a, uh, a whole series with Jake Pates, who's an Olympics uh, snowboarder. It's called Chasing Greatness. That might be a good one for you to listen to because it's about, it's not about snowboarding. It's about just changing your mindset. So you can go from just thinking you're good enough to being, hey, I'm great. I can get to that next level, you know, and busting through kind of like the Thrive, the, the Thrive series with the uh, Napoleon Hill, the wealth consciousness one that we did. Yeah, they're, they're awesome stuff. They really are great stuff. So, well, I appreciate your time. I, I like to ask my guests, this is a new thing that I've thrown in, um, Patrick, is with what you know now, what would you have told the younger, naive uh, Patrick um, that he didn't know then um, that would have made huge changes in, in your health or your thought process or, or your view on life or just something that you wish you would have known then? What would have that have been? Stick with the slow and steady positive results. Don't always look for the breakthrough. So many people wait till they have a breakdown to have a breakthrough. And I think I was that way. I was always looking for the next bio. They didn't call it biohacking back then, but the next thing. I mean, I was the kind of guy that back in the 70s drank Hoffman protein, which tastes like chalk. And I didn't just drink it. I drank it three times a day, 15 scoops with brewer's yeast, which tasted terrible back then. Because I, I thought, you know, because I was an, an athlete, so I wanted to have every advantage. But it probably could have got by with about half of that because I didn't know what that much protein would do to my system. You know, there was no... We have a lot of research now that we didn't, but I think just doing something steady, find a practice, like find a mindfulness practice, do it every day, find, an, find a workout, do it every day. It's not about just doing it once and, and trying to do it so much, but I think that's the one thing. Cause I always, I'm kind of the person that wants the reward and the big celebration after everything. And I've since calmed that down, even, even in my latest year of during the COVID experience, taking off 40 pounds was, I just, every day I said, I'm not going to worry about doing it quick. I'm going to do my workouts every day. I'm going to eat the way that I know to eat. I'm going to, there's no excuses. Nobody's taking me to the finest restaurants in their town. Like would happen if I was traveling, you know, somebody say, well, you got to go to this place. And then of course you got to get this meal and, and eating late at night. I mean, I'm the type of person that I can't eat late at night. I've got to, 
if I can eat closest to dusk or before, it's best for me. That's just what I found for myself. Yeah, those are slow and steady wins the race. That's that's an awesome, lots of clinical pearls definitely throughout this entire podcast. So you did mention with with being able to share a, uh, a 99 cent promotion um, for listeners to start to get their feet wet. So what exactly does that entail? Well, with the 99 cent program, they actually get full access to our app, all the different sessions we were talking about. They can use them. Uh, uh, they can actually use them on two different devices five times a day. So they can have a family member do it as well. They can get the results. Now that's just the sound part of it, but it's still pretty powerful. Uh, can really get the results. Plus they can get a free copy of my book, Thrive and Overdrive. It's a digital version. They can read it on their smartphone or their tablet. Re whether they do anything going forward after the 99 cents or not, they get to keep the book. So they can learn about how stress is affecting their biology and what they can do about it. Because there's a lot of different practices in there. It's not just about the brain tap. It's about our life and how in this day and age, how we can thrive and overdrive, how we can get our body to function in these times of high technology. Yeah, well, you made that evident for the last hour in terms of how we look up stress and how we align ourselves with our thought processes and all the things that we do. Um, but when you have the addition of light wave and vibration and frequency to, and sound to be able to harmonize the hemispheres of the brain and be able to go through different uh, wavelengths, it, it's just that much more powerful. So thank you so much, Dr. Patrick, for being here today and, uh, and, and your continued mission for how far off are you now on a billion brains? Well, we have, we have over 3 million people on the app. So we're still, it was a million, but we, once we, I said, we got to get bigger. So we're still there. All now, right. the nice thing is we're now partners with five different universities in India. So India alone, we can do it. And we partnered with a uh, university even in China. So between those two, we could get a million just by throwing a rock in any direction. Yeah, right. We just got to get them yeah. on the, We just got to get them on the, on the app. But Brazil's come online. We're in South America. We're in 120 different countries now. So it's, awesome. it's growing. So we, we still need your help, Joel, but uh, thank you for having me on the call. Well, thanks for being here. And, and I hope you have a continued rest of your year to be awesome, even though we've had stressful times. Um, you're the type of person from the entire talk that looks at things for the opportunity of it and looking at it in terms of um, half full or even three quarters or four fifths full. And it shows into where you are today. And I, I, I very well appreciate all the information you gave us today. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.